in this series. Some of the things that we've talked about, and just in case you've missed, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but sin and doubt doesn't disqualify you from following Jesus. Everyone Jesus called was a sinner. Everyone that Jesus called had, had, had questions about who he was and, and whether he was really the Messiah or, or how that impacted their life and how that was all going to play out. In fact, one of his closest, one of his 12, had a nickname, Doubting. That was his nickname, Doubting Thomas. Peter, one of the inner circle, when Jesus would say, "Would you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see that Jesus had the 12, and then sometimes he would say, Peter, James, John, come over here. Come a little closer with me. And he would call them into an inner circle. Peter, after Jesus was crucified and buried, had all kinds of questions. Is, is Jesus really who he said he was? This isn't how I thought this was going to play out. I didn't quit fishing just to bury this guy. And scripture says that he went back, he got his boat out, and he went fishing. He went back to what he knew. So he had questions even at the end of the time with Jesus on this planet. Jesus is still calling sinners and doubters to follow him. Jesus is still calling you and me to follow him. And, and I don't know if you get this or not, but he's even calling that person that you work with, live next to, that you struggle with, to follow right alongside of you, to follow him. Last week, we talked about Jesus wants us to have faith in God that overwhelms our fears, that overwhelms our circumstances. He hasn't called us. If we follow him, he's not calling us to be better people. That's not the end game. Although, if you follow Jesus and you become a disciple, a true follower of him, you are going to be a better person. That's, that's going to happen. That, that, that's what's going to happen along the line. He hasn't called us to a, a life that is pain-free and problem-free. But in that journey that we have, he wants our faith, our connection, our understanding, our belief in who he is, our faith to overwhelm even our pain, even our problems, to know that, yeah, that's going on, but my God is even greater. I don't know how these guys in the Old Testament that didn't have a Jesus experience could have done that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three guys get hauled up before the king and get thrown into a fiery furnace. To have that kind of faith that says, our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we still won't bow down. That kind of faith God wants us to have. Say, I know my God can do that. But even if he doesn't, and I don't understand why he wouldn't, I'm still not going to bow down. That kind of faith. Faith that overwhelms our fear. Today, we're going to answer a question as we continue in this series about following. And I know this is a big question. Some of you spent uh, time today wrestling through this question before you came. As a follower of Christ... What am I supposed to wear? Some of you did. You spent time at your closet looking. Hmm. Some of you might have even dug through your hamper. Gave it the sniff test. I can still wear this. I can still do this. But what am I supposed to wear? I know it's a huge question for you. You can tell who people are following by what they wear. Just a few weeks ago, you've seen all kinds of people in Rapid City, South Dakota, and in the hills dressed in leather. Who were they following? Harley David. They were following something. They had something. We're going to look at some, uh, at some photos up here. Who, who's this guy following? Green Bay Packers. Here, I got some news for you. In a couple of weeks, I'm just, I, I believe this with all my heart, we're going to have a projector that we can actually see really well. Um, but but it's, we're, we're waiting to get the speakers and all that put up at the same time because it's, I'm too short to get up there and do it. And so it's all going to happen at the same time. It might be next week, but if not, the following week. How about this, this group? Who are they following? Go Big Red, Cornhuskers. 
You know what? It's so easy. And it's not just sports fans who you can tell who they're following. We got a picture of a gal here. Who's she following? Can you, that's kind of dark. Can you tell? Can't see it? It's a burqa. Who are they following? Muhammad, Islam. How about this next one? Who are these guys following? Buddha. It's not just it's not just sports fans, but there's an attire, there's a dress, and you knew just by what they were wearing, who they're following. So us as Christians, it raises the question, what should we wear? Well, we're going to answer that question today. So next week we can all come looking like, no, 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 not that one, not yet. But, but so here, here's some options, and, and, but, but if you know what people are following by what they wear, as Christians, what should we wear? So how about this? This is one option. Anybody like this look? <laughs> we got one or two? Okay. How, how about this is the other extreme of the, of the what we should wear. God hates you. Hmm. Well, I'm not going to promote either one of these two looks. In the New Testament, though, the Apostle Paul tells us what to wear. He, he makes it very clear what we are to put on, what we are to wear. And that should make you a little nervous, because he wrote this 2,000 years ago, before the invention of the zipper, before jeans, before tennis shoes, before comfortable undergarments, he came up with what we're supposed to wear. Before we go there, I want to tell you a little bit about Paul, a little bit about this guy, because we've been spending a lot of time in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're the, the, the life account, the eyewitness account of Jesus on this planet. And now we're going to look at Paul, some of the things that he said about Jesus and what we're supposed to wear. Paul, before he became Paul, was known as Saul. Saul of Tarsus. Saul uh, was a man who was very religious. He was a zealot. He was someone that studied. And, and as far as if there was a hierarchy in that studying and where you were in the place, he would have been uh, amazing. He was the top of his class. He was someone that was very excited about following God and what Judaism was all about. And so when this Jesus came on the scene, died and rose and and, and this group of people that started believing in his resurrection called the way Christians, his job, his purpose in life, he thought, was to eradicate, to wipe out, to destroy, to get rid of all of them. He got permission from the religious leaders and the legal system of the day to actually do that, to go to synagogues and house churches and anywhere that these people were huddled together and, and practicing and teaching about Jesus and kill them. He had permission to do that, and that's what he was doing. So that's, we're going to take our cue what to wear from him. But, but something happened to this person who was on this journey to, to, to wipe out Christianity. He had an encounter with the very being he was trying to get rid of. Jesus, God, meets him. He has an encounter with him. And this person, Saul, who is wiping out the church, all of a sudden becomes a church planter. All of a sudden, starts. he continues to tour, he continues to travel, but he goes into all of these places and he begins to teach on the very person that he was trying to get rid of. Now this is just a side note, this is not in my notes, but could you imagine if you were one of those people who maybe... You saw your husband or wife be drug out and stoned and killed because of Saul. And then that same person coming and saying, oh, no, no, but I've changed my ways. Now I'm one of you. Kind of a doubt situation would pop up in my mind. Was he sneaking in, trying to get into the inner circle so we can get a whole list of people, so we can get our emails, so we can get our addresses and, and track us down? But he continued to do this. He goes into town after town after town, and, and people would come out and listen to what he was saying, and then they would plant a church. And then he would go to another town, and people would come out, and they say, oh, man, I have questions about what you said. And they would come out, and they would listen, and there would be a group of people, 10, 20, 30, 40, who'd plant a church. 
And then he, he couldn't go all these places, so he started writing letters. He started writing down stuff, and he would send them back to this church or that church, and that's where we get most of the books outside of the Gospels and Acts, written by Paul. This person whose job was to wipe out Christianity, now he becomes a dedicated follower. Paul teaches something that Jesus taught his disciples. He takes one of Jesus' teachings and, and amplifies it and makes it very clear. So we're going to look first at this Jesus teaching in John 13, 33. If you have your Bibles or, or your computers, you can, you can turn with us to uh, John 13, 33. Jesus says to his disciples, he's got his followers close in because he's telling them something very important. And this is kind of, as I'm leaving, I want you to remember this. This is something that's important. Where I am going, you cannot come. Jesus is he's starting this off, I think, just to get their attention, maybe. Where I'm going, you can't come. But he, he keeps on going. A new commandment I give you. Now, just like when we have a word from God, I've said often, man, if that was really a word from God, we need to stop and listen to it. If Jesus comes up with the 11th commandment, you think these guys are going to go, wait, 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 we have 10. You're giving us a new one? There's going to be an add-on to this? So he's going, a new commandment I give you, love one another. Love one another. Goes on, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. He's, I'm not saying you love one another like you love one another. Don't love each other like your wife loves you, or don't love like your dad loved you. Don't love others like you love your dog. Don't love others like you love the person that you really like. Because that makes it easy, because there are some people I really don't like that much. And if God would have said, just love people the best you can, I'd go, okay, I can do that. Love people like you feel like liking them, like you feel like loving them. But he didn't say that. He said, love like I love. Love people like I love them. You know what? When he said that, I'm sure Matthew kind of cringed. Because Matthew, we looked at a few weeks ago, he was a tax collector. He was sitting at a tax collector's booth collecting taxes, ripping off his fellow Jewish person, his neighbor, his relative, getting rich off of them. And this Jesus walks up and makes eye contact with him and smiles and talks to him. Matthew hadn't received this kind of interaction from another human being since he became a tax collector. Maybe other tax collectors in him could joke. Him and other sinners could get together and maybe laugh, but not to have that feel like I'm worth something. Jesus came up to Matthew and, and said, follow me. Wow. That's amazing. Maybe they, when he said love people like You've seen me love them. Maybe they remembered that day that Jesus and them were hanging out and, and the religious leaders brought a woman who was caught in the act of adultery and threw him at Jesus' feet and was trying to trap him and say, we caught her in the act. What should we do to her? The law says that we should stone her. You know the story. Jesus begins to ride in the sand. Jesus begins to do all kinds of stuff. He teaches. He just is loving this woman as this is going on. And he says, let him without sin cast the first stone. He was the only one that could do that. But he saw her and he loved her and affirmed her as a creation of God. One that was wonderfully and magnificently put together by God. They're going, we're supposed to love like that? Not like I want to love that person? Peter might have been saying like, oh, man, you're telling me I have to love people like Matthew, like you loved Matthew? That, that's more than I can handle. Love people the way that I love people, Jesus say. This is where Peter, I mean, excuse me, where Paul got so much of where he was teaching from 
from the writings of Christ, from the teachings of the disciples. He goes on in verse 35 to say, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. This is how, this is the clothes that you're going to have on. This is how they're going to know you're my disciples, if you love one another, like I love them. That's how we'll know. I love this part, that this is how you'll be marked. This is how people will know. This is what's going to set you apart. This is a new commandment, Jesus is saying, I'm giving you. I love this next verse, 36. Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? You get that? So Jesus says, I'm going somewhere you can't go. He says, he lays out this new commandment, this big revelation, love people like I love them. Peter says, where are you going? You're going somewhere that we can't go? Peter got stuck on this little point, which is not, a, I mean, he's going somewhere, but that's huge. But the big point that he was trying to get across was love people the way that I love them. Peter got hung up on, I'm leaving, you can't come with me. And he probably missed at this moment this teaching of Jesus. Love people like I love them. You're going somewhere? Wait a minute, I, I, I want to know where you're going. This should make us feel pretty good, though, because there's a lot of time that I, along with you, get caught up on little things and we miss the big thing that God wants to do in our life. We get caught up in, oh my goodness, it was cold at church today. I couldn't even hear a word that was being said. The music was so loud. The music wasn't loud enough. It was too light. It was too dark. It was too whatever. Could you see what that guy was doing at church? And we get all focused on these little things and we miss person that God has sitting right next to us or that we walk right by and God's saying let's go. I did that for a purpose today and just like Peter we get stuck on where, where are you going when are you going to go there will we ever, I don't know what all he was doing we need to get this Jesus is saying by this people will know that you're my fathers put this on As a Christian, it's easy for us to get caught up in in keeping rules rather than building relationships. It's it's just the way we are. And not just Christians, it's people, It's, it's all religions, but it's us as people. Rules are easier than relationships. Anybody have a relationship that's messy? Don't raise your hand. You got one of those and you go like, ooh, I, I, people, I just don't like them. I wish I could just give them rules. I, God, just give me a list of rules and I'll do my best. The ones I can keep really good, I'll brag about. The ones I don't do so well on, I'll ask for forgiveness because your word said you'll forgive me a million times and you'll never remember them again. So I'm just going to continue to screw up on this rule because it's really hard but I'll ask for forgiveness, but I like them better than this relationship stuff that you're calling me to. Why? Because I'm in control of rules. I'm in control of those rule keeping. Rule seem easy. Loving people seems hard. Relationships, even our best ones, even our closest ones, are messy. Family. Don't look around. Look straight ahead. Family is messy. It is. It's just the way it is. And yet God has called us to be not about rules, but to be about relationships, to be about discipleship. Jesus know that. uh, He knows that love is the greatest thing. Love, by this everyone will know that you're my disciple. If you love one another. It's easy for us to confuse discipleship. No, 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 no. I'm I'm sorry, I said that wrong. It's easy to confuse discipline, rules, with discipleship, relationships. It's easy to get those. And and discipline is is great. We've talked about the disciplines. Fasting, 
meditation, solitude, prayer, reading your Bible, all of those things are huge. We have to have them in our lives, but that's not what people will know that we're Christians by, how often we fast, by how much of our Bible we read, by how much of the Bible you've memorized. You know, unfortunately, some of the people that know the Bible the best are some of the hardest people to be around sometimes. Because they keep pointing out everything in people's lives, in relationship, a relationship, relationship. Some 20 years after this teaching that we just looked at, Jesus telling his disciples, Paul comes and he writes this down. Now this is important to realize because there's a lot of people that will tell you the Bible uh, was written hundreds and hundreds of years after Jesus. There were, there were no eyewitnesses around. And really scholars that have done some a great study and know the most about this would say that most of this Paul stuff was written 20 to 22 years after Jesus was on the planet. So Paul sat down and talked with Peter, James, and John. Paul sat down and talked with these guys and got their information from him, and he put this down. You know, when Paul's talking about, you know, uh, when we read in the Bible about Stephen being murdered, Paul was there when that happened, the first martyr. He was holding the clothes of, of the people that were doing the stoning. And so all of this happened in a very short window. Paul takes this teaching, and, and he really amplifies it. He really uh, specifies what this is talking about. It doesn't take much time, and, and this is what Paul, is why he's doing this and why he's amplifying it, why he's telling it again, because it doesn't take much time to go from relationship to rule. And he was finding that these churches that he was planning were, 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 were gravitating towards the rules, gravitating towards do, 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 don't, 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 be, 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 don't, you know, all of that kind of stuff rather than loving one another. So he goes into there. Therefore, this is Colossians 3.12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Okay, so he's talking to you. He could be writing this letter to the church of Westgate Community Church. And he's saying, you guys, as chosen people, God's chosen you, and he said, follow me holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with. This is what I want you to wear. This is what I want you to put on. He's not saying a suit and tie. Some of you would love to go uh, maybe back a few decades and everybody comes in suit and ties and wears their Sunday best, but I'm telling you, even in, in Paul, he wasn't saying that. He's saying, I'm going to tell you what's important to put on, what's important to wear. So he says, I'm going to tell you what to clothe. Paul is going to, he's telling us what to mentally and emotionally put on. Purposely put on. Look in your closet and make sure that this is on before you walk out of the house so people will know that you're Christians. This is not something that accidentally happens. This is something that we need to purposely put on. Because if we don't, if we don't purposely look at what he's saying, we're going to go, where are you going, Jesus? Well, I, I'm going to miss the big point. I'm going to get caught up on something else, and I'm going to sound like it's really important, but I'm going to miss what you really want me to have today. Because to do this, as Christians, as followers, we need to be purposeful. This isn't an accidental thing. Put on compassion. Well, compassion What's compassion? It's love somebody with all your heart. Have you ever loved something so much that it hurt? Did you ever have that? It just it kind of hurt way down deep. Something happened. There was tension. There was something happened, but you loved this person, and maybe there was conflict, or there was something going on, and it just, oh, man. I remember stuff happening where you lose your appetite. Some of you go like, I wish I lost my appetite. I feel like eating when I feel that way. You know, we all have different emotions, how they hit us and all that. But to love somebody down deep. Now, when this was being written, it wrote, whatever, it wasn't love them with all your heart. The Greek word would be love them with all your bowels. The seat of emotion in, in, in this time wasn't the heart. We've kind of moved that up. 
it, it was the bowels. And that's kind of like when you really, when something really happens and it, it really affects your love or, or kind of way down in here that you feel that, which doesn't make for good poetry, you know? Don't tell my heart, my achy, breaky heart. Wouldn't that, you know, it just wouldn't be the same. Don't tell my bowels, my achy, breaky bowels. I just don't think they'd understand. No, nobody would understand that. I love you with all my bowels. We wouldn't have very many weddings going on here. I give you my bowels. Oh, Lord, thank you that we've moved that up just a little bit. Have you ever loved something so much that it hurt? That's compassion. People need to know that you love them deeply before we start pointing out some of the rules. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying if you love people, there's going to be no rules. That There are rules. There are things that we are supposed to do and not do, things that we're to be about and things that we're supposed to not be about. But Jesus, I think, knows that that's easy for us to go to, and he's going, love people first. Love them first. Love them first. And once you love somebody enough that you've earned the right to be heard, it's different when somebody comes up and says, hey, you know what? I, I noticed something different about you, and I want to ask you, how can I be more like you in a certain situation? Well, then, you know, you, you've earned the right to kind of speak into somebody's life at that time. But when we come up going like, stop that, don't do that, be more like this, people just go, eh, 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 eh. they don't even want to hear you. So love, compassion. The next one, put on kindness. Kindness. Loan somebody your strength. Be their strength for them, with them, in a certain situation. You come alongside of somebody. I think of people in my life that are some of my best friends today. When I think of and, and, and coming alongside, I, I, a buddy of mine, Troy and Jennifer Vandeman, but Troy has just become a great friend. And, and really, when that happened was his 16-year-old daughter was killed in a car wreck. And I can remember not knowing what to do, but I just came alongside of Troy every day. I, I don't even know how many days this went on, but I would just come over. Troy would be sitting on his porch with his hands in his head, just going, why, what, what's going on, what is going on? And I just sat there next to him. Let him yell, let him ask questions, let him doubt, let him ramble, but just be there coming alongside of somebody. Sometimes it's just being close enough to somebody that you breathe together. Compassion. Humility. Viewing myself accurately. Humility. Viewing myself accurately. Not believing my own press. Not being a puffed up person. But being humble. Not cutting myself slack while cutting you no slack. Expecting more of you and making excuses for myself. But when I'm humble, I come and I see myself just as I am, which is the same as you, a sinner saved by grace. Someone that apart from the grace of God isn't going to hell. No matter how good I am, I see that, I know that. It's just who I am. Gentleness. He says, put on gentleness. This means... Uh, meeting people right where they are. When I am Jesus, when I'm putting on Jesus, when I'm putting on this love, I meet people right where they are. Jesus met Matthew where? Right where he was. Where did him and Matthew go immediately after he said, come follow me? They went to Matthew's house. Jesus loved Matthew right where where he was. He didn't love him and hope that he would stay there, but he loved them right where there was. The woman at the well, Jesus met her right where she was. And we need to love people with gentleness, not one-upping them. You know, and this is tough, because I love telling stories. Any storytellers here, you love telling stories. So somebody tells a story or a joke, 
and you go like, oh, I got one better than that. And you, you've ever been with that person that tries to one-up your story all the time? It's like, give me a break. And that's it's something I've had a fight with. So if I've done that with you, I apologize. You know, you got to put it in the back of your mind and go, okay, in a month I'm going to tell my story. You know, <laughs> but whatever. But you just got to do that. You just got to go, I'm not going to one-up you. It, 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 gentleness is realizing where people are and meeting them right there. It's the difference between picking up a contact and a bowling ball. I pick them both up, but I pick them up differently. I have to pick up a contact very gently, very, oh man, I want to make sure that I get that and I don't break it. You don't pick up a contact like a bowling ball. <coughs> Only if you don't want to wear it again. That's gentleness. Patience. It's deciding to go the speed of the other person. I, I'm going to decide to go at your pace. I'm going to slow down or speed up to be with you. Walk with people. Can, again, that's relational. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to go your speed. Now, a couple of big thoughts about this. I'll get wrapped up, starting with verse 13. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Why does he keep saying that? Why is that comparison to Jesus? Why can't it be, I forgive like Peter did? I forgive like Paul did. No, I forgive like Jesus did. Treat others like God treated you. Forgive like God has forgiven you. Be patient with others like God is patient with you. Be gentle with others the way God is gentle with you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Put on love. I'm a follower. What am I supposed to wear? I'm supposed to clothe myself with these the co compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. It all comes together with love. This comes from Paul, the person who was persecuting the church, the person whose main objective before his encounter was to get rid of this, this person who had an encounter and ended up writing most of the New Testament. We see that this is not natural for us. I think this is why Jesus emphasized it and why Paul comes and emphasizes it over and over and again, because it's not natural. Paul says this late in his ministries. I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing all the time. I wonder if he's saying, I want to be gentle, but I'm not. I want to be compassionate, but I lean this way. I want to be patient with you. I want to be gentle, but not so much. It doesn't come naturally. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I find myself doing all the time. He is, and he's just like us. He was and is just like us. I think that's us. I want to do good. I want to be godly. I want to be that. But you know what? Some days you're a little more tired. Some days you're a little bit more hungry. Some days you're a little bit more annoyed. Some days you're a little less gentle, even with the people that you love the most. And can I be real honest with you? Sometimes the people that we struggle with the most are the people that we love the most. Because sometimes we think we get cut more slack or we just go, you know what, they know my what if God's calling us not only to love our enemies, but love those that we love dearly and let them transform us in that. And still as a follower, I need to hang out I need to spend time with Jesus. I want to leave you with one more verse. Uh, worship team, come on up, just in case I, I put you to work again. Romans 13, 14. Paul here again is saying, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put it on. What am I supposed to put on? If you can't remember all of them, just say, I put on Jesus. I'm going to love like Jesus. I'm going to be gentle like Jesus. I'm going to be humble like Jesus. I'm going to be patient like Jesus. 
put on Jesus and make no provision for the flesh. Do you get that? Put on Jesus and make no provision for the flesh. I've got to starve. I can't provide for it. I can't feed it. I can't nurture it. I can't give it nutrition. I'm supposed to starve it. Give no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. You know what? It's about relationship. But what I'm going to call you to this day, kind of what we talked about with communion. Who are you going to commune with this week? What you spend time thinking about, meditating on, dreaming about, worrying about, is really what begins to grow in you. And if I can spend more time in this, if I can spend more time on my face before God, if I can spend more time sharing my concerns, my doubts, my fears, the things I'm struggling with, my sins, with God, and I spend time listening to what he's saying to me and not get caught up in the, where are you going? Like, okay, let's start this over again. This is where I'm going, but this is what I want you to do today. Put on this. Be about loving others. What I watch, what I think about, what I dream about, what I read, what I listen to, that's all important stuff. You go like, oh, it's just background noise. It's just something I listen to when I'm in my car. If it's just that, put on a worship tape. If that's all it is, put your Bible on and listen to Scripture. Say, oh, I get kind of daydreaming. I don't pay attention. Well, then don't pay attention to the music. Pay attention, don't pay attention to God's Word. Just let it kind of seep in. Spend time with Jesus. You become like what you spend time with. I gotta tell you, when we moved to Nebraska, I was anything but a Cornhusker fan. After four years of living around those crazy, weird, red people, I became a Cornhusker fan. Now, I've always been a Packer fan. That's just right. You know? But what you spend time with, you become like. If you spend time complaining, worrying, doubting, questioning, although questioning and doubting is okay, but where are you spending, where do you get your answers from? Just spending that and asking people, are you spending it getting answers 